Okay, good day and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Alex Mlu from IBC Amina. We have the monthly webinar. This is the Country Insights webinar, and we have the pleasure of being joined by um, a lady who I've known for around 15 years. Uh, May I probably shouldn't actually say the exact number, but uh, somebody I met over in Dubai in Jitex working in IT with. Um, a previous entity, but uh, I've known May for a very long time and uh, I've always respected her ability, not just to, to do PR, but also as well her insights into the region, especially into her own home country. So May is the co-founder and CEO of Publicist Inc, a Cairo-based agency. And you're gonna be talking to us about exploring comms in Egypt. I'm gonna hand over to you now, May. Thank you very much, uh, Alex, for the wonderful intro. Yes, we do go way, way back. Um, happy to announce the number of years. It's all right. Um, and I'm glad to be doing this uh, for the IABC MENA. I hope it's useful. I could do, I think, at least about 10 of these to really talk about communications in Egypt. But let try and cover it all in, uh, in this one. Um, all right, so um, I'm trying to scroll, but I'm not sure if the presentation is moving. Ah, here we go. All right, so um, thank you for just a little bit more. Yes, I have been in the uh, public relations industry for fifth uh, Dubai and uh, working mostly with the tech and telecom sector uh, across the region uh, in Jordan as well as Kuwait um, and then when I moved to Egypt uh, to work on the general authority for investment for a couple of years uh, promoting uh, as an FBI Europe the Mid and the Middle East um, and Asia. And then following the January 25th uh, revolution in 2011, um, didn't really have uh, in terms of EU. Uh, so here we are today, uh, on 11, we're 20, um, we were August 2011. Uh, today we are 20 and working with some of the biggest clients. Our kickoff in November 2011 was actually with Coca-Cola on a CSR uh, initiative uh, that we launched in Gzeft uh, al in an area of Cairo as part of the development program. Uh, we were two people when we did this project, uh, two people and an intern with uh, mobilizing 250 volunteers Uh, graffiti artists, musicians, uh, to create this uh, this one day event. Uh, and then on later years, we and part of the MMK network. Uh, our current clients uh, include Uber, uh, current employees on uh, developing their communications uh, capabilities. And of course, we work across different sectors on a number of projects uh, in the tech and startup work with a number of clients there, uh, in the fashion and retail industry as well, and music. Um, and conference and, and business and economy events uh, across the region as well. Uh, so I hope that was a, just to tell everybody who Publicist Inc. is um, and going straight into our topic for today. So before we talk about communications in Egypt, we need to understand the landscape that we work, operate in. Uh, it is quite a complex one. Um, so I'm going to try and, and take you through it uh, in a very, very simple way. Um, and it's 
basically split into two phases. The first one is pre-2011. Uh, pre-2011, public relations entered Egypt through uh, uh, Lula Zalama in 1982. Uh, she was the first uh, pioneer to bring public relations uh, as a profession to the Egyptian market. And after that, a handful of you know, uh, global networks entered the market throughout the 90s. Uh, the peak was around 1999 with the tech firms, so the Microsofts and the IBMs. Uh, with the establishment of a Ministry of Telecommunications, uh, these giants started to be really, really active in the market and then began bringing their global agency uh, partners and, and uh, local outfits started to set up as well. Um, and then we have after 2011, that's when there was a big paradigm shift. Uh, post 2011, there was an explosion of communication, uh, of demand for communication professionals because we had suddenly had political campaigning, uh, elections, uh, whether they're parliamentary, political parties, presidential, a, much, a very, very aggressive media landscape, and of course, the uh, uh, social media, the face explosion of Facebook and Twitter in Egypt all happened in 2000. 11. So everything changed after that. Um, PR agencies, digital agencies, social media agencies, uh, uh, one, spot, one man shows, the demand was huge, but there was not that much of a talent pool um, to hire from and no skills or knowledge because it simply was not an industry that people aspired to work in or a profession that uh, young Egyptians wanted to be a uh, part of. So we saw, you know, a lot of boutique firms open up, uh, journalists working as public relations consultants, there were startups, small businesses, and also at the time, a lot of people started to open up their own businesses and require communication experts to support them. The bigger, larger organizations went a little bit quiet in the first couple of years after the revolution because there, there were a lot of ties to the previous government, so they were not as proactive. We were kind of on a wait and see mode uh, to see what happens. And, and you know, with the multinationals, uh, there was a little bit less stability thinking about what's going to happen in the country. Um, so you started to see demand for smaller brands uh, to communicate, to create buzz, to become known, to set up their uh, digital presence. Um, particularly in consumer segments, so the FMB, FMCGs, uh, and so on. And then you have a much more critical period for, for business communicators, which happens from 2016 to 2018. You're looking at currency devaluation, uh, energy subsidies dropped, a World Bank loan, a new investment law, and the encouragement of, of FDI, all of which led to great business opportunities, not just for professional communications, but also for differentiation. That was very, very important. And now, Looking at uh, the media landscape, of course, because to understand, uh, once we don't understand the political sphere, the media landscape is changing significantly as we speak at the moment. Okay, uh, but we have basically a lot of private sector owned, public sector owned broadcasters, newspapers. There's real challenges in maintaining. Uh, of course, this is you know a challenge that has been in the media industry globally for years, which is maintaining revenues from print. But again, we're a population of 100 million people. Uh, not So print is still an important, print and broadcasts are still critical. It's not just digital media, but they're still uh, struggling to survive uh, from advertising revenues. And at the same time, the internet is exploding and people are using all kinds of, uh, and you know, it's always information, not just uh, traditional news media. And of course, you have a media environment that is facing a lot of 
contractors uh, with websites being blocked uh, and a bit of control being placed um, and you have conglomerates that are take conglomerates that are stored uh, of the of the various news websites. Hello? Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so as I was saying, uh, there was there's a lot of change happening in the media um, uh, with earned uh, securing earned uh, coverage for a lot of organizations is becoming a lot more of a challenge. And so trying to use communications in a much more creative way uh, is becoming more critical. What does this actually mean and how do you operate as a communicator in a market of 100 million consumers uh, where mass media uh, Option, your options within mass media are a lot more limited now uh, and also social media rules are changing as well so how can we adapt we have uh, as I was saying very very quickly um, that are you know government mouthpieces you have private sector newspapers that try to focus on business and economic news but you know it's they're not that focused on it, especially when you talk about brands and organizations, everything that you communicate about a company or a brand, is, even if it's a news release, uh, is most more often than not perceived as advertising, unless it's a major investment, it's a CSR initiative, or it's something of major newsworthiness. So company launches product X is absolutely not a publishable piece of news, no matter what it is. Uh, we have radio networks uh, which have huge, huge reach. Uh, people in Egypt, particularly in, in Cairo and Alexandria, spend significant time in their cars, which means radio is huge. Um, at this point in time, there, uh, we know that there are around 18 million radio sets across the country, and that's not counting cars, car radios. Um, there are a lot of networks. The focus is mainly on uh, music, entertainment, a little bit of national news and sports. Um, and then you've got television media, so you've got a lot of networks, as I was saying, uh, mostly owned by the same entity. Um, so there are some commercial interests there that are, you know, you need, we need to always keep into consideration if you're an agency or if you're, if you're a brand. Uh, it is still the most popular media platform in Egypt. Uh, you have six local channels, a network of satellite channels. 98% um, of Egyptians have a television set in their home. Um, and it's still the most common source of news, particularly primetime talk shows. Talk shows are extremely powerful. Uh, if whatever is happening in the country, um, if it's not most of the time, if the talk shows didn't talk about it, it's almost like it didn't happen, as far as the mass population is concerned. Um, and then, of course, the digital revolution. Okay, so 47 million is the number of internet users in Egypt, uh, and 37 million of those are on Facebook. So mobile internet, the, the, the lines between social and online media are also blurred because now news media focus their content on what's going to go viral, not what's newsworthy or what's actually important for the business reader, but what, what's the headline that's going to make this piece go viral and that's going to make people share it when I post it on Facebook as a news organization. That's the driver. That's the main motivator. Uh, for the, all the content strategies. Um, and that's what we always have to think about when we're communicating um, and when we're creating news and writing our content. And of course, with that came um, the Instagram and Facebook influencers. I don't want to say blogging that much, apart from newspaper columnists, um, but we do have a lot of bloggers. Um, 
In Egypt, the influencers categories that are the most active and have the strongest communities are the ones you see in front of you. So predominantly sports and fashion, food, a little bit of travel, uh, cinema stars, of course, and comedians and Facebook uh, vloggers. Those are the most popular. In addition to Facebook communities, uh, particularly those that revolve around women's issues. So whether they are mother, um, uh, fashion uh, followers, and also some that revolve around very, very niche communities. So specific uh, university uh, alumni or um, like the AUC um, or residents of particular areas and geographies like the 6th of October or um, downtown Cairo, Zemelik, etc. So they're much more niche uh communities but they're quite influential um and the challenge here is and when we talk about what clients want and i'm going to get to this later which is who are they talking to what is an organization really trying to say and to whom and this is this matters a lot more in this market because of the challenges we mentioned earlier so having looked at the context what is it that organizations, whether we you know, refer to them as clients from an agency perspective, really, really need. Whether they are a startup, small business, or a large institution, they all need to establish all of these. They need to have a positioning, a well-managed digital footprint. It doesn't have to be everywhere, but they need to be somewhere uh, in a powerful way. Um, they need to be consistent. So if here today, gone tomorrow does not work in this market. You need to be consistent and you need to understand as a brand or as an organization that with communications, you are not just buying the eyeballs and the clicks of today. You need to be thinking about buying the hearts and minds for tomorrow, which is why you need to be working on building a, re a reputable brand and enlisting endorsers and advocates for the long run. Thinking about your objectives, they need to be clear, measurable and specific. You, um, brands and organizations should not be engaging with communicator, communication professionals uh, without knowing what it is they want out of them. And that's the only way you can get KPIs and measurable results. Um, of course, it has to be. You have to be aware of what stage of the communication process you're at. If you're now focusing on creating awareness or uh, providing a deeper understanding of your product or service, or if you're working on building a community, because you can't be everything to everyone all the time. Um, you just need to be very, very focused on what phase uh, you're currently. Um, engaged in and the investment in communications and PR needs to be bought at the highest decision making level of the organization. Um, if it's not, it's never going to be perceived as a bad And of course, most importantly, who, who are you addressing? Again, you're not going to be all things to all people at all times. Stakeholder mapping becomes more critical. Am I talking to businesses? Am I talking to the media at large? Am I more interested in government and policy makers, um, business decision makers, students, consumers uh, within a certain demographic? You need to break it down. Uh, market research here becomes ever more critical. And if we're talking about consumers, there are so many challenges and pain points that are impacting the consumer mindset today. Soaring prices, rising fuel prices, uh, tax increased taxation. Uh, businesses are facing a challenge of sustaining a diminishing demand. Yes, we're a population of 100 million, but those with the purchasing power are only about, you know, the, the high purchasing power. We're talking about 10% on average. So we really need to think about who we're talking to and what we want out of them. Uh, because even those top 10% with the high purchasing power, even their purchasing habits have changed and are being adapted to adjust to the financial reality and the pressure on the wallets that we have going on today in the, in the market. Um, that's from a consumer perspective, of course. From a business perspective, um, if you're a, a foreign investor in this market, 
public policy and public affairs is critical. Um, so we need to be talking about this, defining what is the strategy and what is it achieving? Um, which method of communication am I using right now and what am I expecting out of it? Uh, whether I, if I'm going to do media relations outreach, I need to be aware of the content and why I'm using the media and which media outlets. Uh, measurement by volume of coverage or uh, add value equivalency and so on. It's a lot of organizations still work with that, but honestly, in this market, as with many others, it's no longer an indicator. Uh, of whether or not you're creating real impact um, on your target audience. And then it's important for an organization to choose its communication platforms. There are tens of them. You can't, you know, these are just four examples. to your stakeholders. Are you an innovator? Do you advocate empowerment uh, of I hope everyone can still hear me. Um, okay, moving on um, to basically what, what does all this mean? It means you need to have a phased approach, uh, establish a solid ground, continue to drive positioning and credibility for your organization. And that's what we help uh, our clients and brands do is build credibility uh, with their target audience and stay consistent. What is it that communicators working or operating in Egypt need to know about local culture? Um, a lot. But I'm going to try and sum it up, okay? Because, again, we are a population of 100 million. You, as an organization, you're addressing um, whoever it is you're talking to. You're most of the time addressing a very small percentage of that. And you're working through... Uh, when we're talking about mass communication, you're working through a limited number of channels. So creativity in terms of audience engagement is very, very important. We are on, we're 100 million of which only 20 million are in Cairo, uh, greater Cairo. Um, we're a very Cairo-centric industry, um, although Alexandria is up and coming, but the rest of the governors see very, very little attention. Because the decision making is, is in Cairo, the business decision makers, the, math, uh, the purchasing powers, a lot of it is in Cairo. So the focus is very much here. Um, but we need to understand that we're much in a wider, we're operating in a much wider context than that. Um, when we're thinking, understanding the consumer mindset is really, really important, um, especially when we talk about crisis management uh, and crisis planning. We have had a number of situations uh, with clients uh, who are based outside of Egypt, so non-local non, non organizations, with when crises occur, uh, um, they come to us with the crisis management manual that was created abroad. It does not work. Uh, we've always advised against it because sometimes the, the, the the procedure to follow, for instance, crises response uh, scenarios on social media uh, and the way that statements are drafted and 
responded to. Um, but very, very badly here. Um, and the way that uh, the final like 24 hours of it appearing differs humongously from uh, other markets because consumer behavior, uh, mob mentality, consumer psychology, the online users' behavior and psychology is, is, is really different. Uh, and the way that people receive corporate responses is very, very different. Um, so that's important. And of course, also understanding the purchasing power of the audience that we're talking to and understanding the context in which people live and their priorities in life. Um, when it comes to public policy, understanding, of course, the power structures, uh, the decision-making chains, um, what your target, which ministry you're targeting, which governor, or which government entity uh, as a business that wants to operate here and invest here and, and generate revenue out of being here. Um, when you're defining your communication strategy, you need to keep all of this in mind. And of course, your business imperatives. Um, creating a momentary buzz does not achieve business goals. Um, it only does what it what that is, which is a buzz. So it's very important to stay focused, uh, have very, very clear KPIs, and that's basically what we try to do with our clients is we put things into the wider context. We consult uh, based on all the different uh, macro and micro factors that impact the environment in which an organization uh, functions and behaves and the stakeholders that it, um, it addresses. The biggest challenge we have is talent. Uh, it, is an, it is an industry that is still lacking in, in strongly skilled uh, communications professionals. Um, it's something that we need to build and we need to, to work with educators, uh, universities, uh, high schools even, on, uh, on improving. Uh, the talent of communicators uh, here, which when it comes to writing skills, when it comes to understanding the profession um, and the science of its own. And that's something we're always, always struggling with. Um, finally, just to wrap up in terms of the takeaways, oh, communication media is very much tied to uh, the overall political socioeconomic media landscapes, which as I said, we're changing significantly and are still changing as we speak. Um, so it's important to keep your finger on the pulse of all of these changes. Being very, very focused and defining what it is you want from your communications outreach this month, this quarter, this year, um, to know whether or not you're getting your ROI. And of course, understanding the stakeholder psychographics and demographics are critically important. Um, I I think that's it for me, and I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Thank you very much, Mine. Uh, and hi, everyone. This is Bia. You saw me on the chat window. And uh, this has been a really insightful look into Egypt. And after doing myself a webinar about communications in Lithuania, it's very interesting to compare how different country realities are different. and. We have some things in common, like uh, some of the things that we are starting pretty late. And then there are some of the things that are pretty different. Uh, so my, I, have a, I want to kick off with the first question for myself. Uh, why do you think everything is starting later in Egypt? Um, there are a number of reasons for that. When you say later, do you mean in terms of digital uh, communications or mm -hmm. later as in? In terms of PR, in terms of digital communications, basically some of the stages that are, that are coming in, in, the, in the communications. I mean, there, there are a number of things. I think most some of it has always been there, just not recognized as important uh, or critical. And the industry grew in the past few years, as I said. I, I believe the reasons may have been related to, as I said, the political environment. Honestly speaking, I think it was the need for 
uh, what, uh, campaigning, when we started to talk about political campaigning in Egypt, and this was the first time in history uh, of the country uh, that this ever happened. And, and that was when um, people started to realize that communications as a profession and lobbying and uh, strategic media outreach um, and strategic uh, content is important. Um, in terms of the, the delay with the, the rest of the traditional media catching up, it, it definitely is down to the, the digital literacy of the population. Although we are all online, uh, pretty much, uh, in terms of internet penetration, the majority of online users uh, are on Facebook uh, rather than other uh, platforms. And that's, as I said, that's where they use um, uh, the source of news is. Um, so how journalists and editors and news, uh, news media adapt to that has been a, a conversation that is still ongoing. Right, so for example, Twitter is not that popular here in Egypt. It is, it's, it, had its down, uh, it had a down period at some point, it's still quite active. Um, especially with activism, it was always active from 2011 to 2013. I would say it was the most influential platform, uh, even more than Facebook on a national level, uh, because of political activism, uh, news sharing, and so on, and the spread of the, the really fast spreading of hashtags. Um, but Facebook took over big time. I can think of understand. But for brands, also, uh, if we're talking about brands uh, and, and consumer organizations, there was a time when they were afraid of Twitter. Uh, they, and they decided not to use it as a channel because it was, to, to, to a lot of brands, it, for, especially when crises happened, it was too much to handle in terms of controlling the outbursts and controlling the exposure. So. There were brands that opted to not even be there. Right. So yeah, to, to, to be on the channel, you have to also have resources to manage it. Yeah. So mm -hmm. um, one more question from me. Uh, if anybody wants to ask a question, feel free to put it in the chat window on, on your on your webex. Oh, sorry, on the go to webinar. And uh, meanwhile, I was curious to ask you my one question, maybe from your comms practice, maybe not, not necessarily, but um, obviously it's not an easy task to do communications in Egypt. But could you name uh, a company or a brand which you think did it so well and why? Which, which, you, which you would outline as a, as a good case practice? Sure. I can use some examples from uh, work that we've done that reflects what I was talking about in terms of consistency and positioning, particularly. Um, we, uh, up until a year ago, we worked over a three-year period with an organization um, in the healthcare sector uh, called uh, Medel. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Medel. Medel is a, an Austrian, uh, Austria-based uh, company that manufactures uh, cochlear implants. So they make the implants that uh, are surgically implanted into children's ears who, who have uh, hearing uh, disabilities. Um, when we started working with uh, Medel uh, about three or four years ago, they had already been in Egypt uh, operating for about 30 years. So it was a market they were already present in, but it was very stagnant. What was the challenge? The challenge was there was no awareness, almost no awareness among uh, uh, in the market of the importance of, rec of uh, detection of hearing loss problems before the age of six. Because after the age, uh, sorry, the, uh, after the age of uh, six or seven, I believe, it's too late for the child to have the cochlear implant uh, surgery, and they uh, lose their hearing uh, for life. So there was there was a lot of there was no awareness. There were a lot of uh, health causes 
that's dominant in the in the in people's community minds. So heart problems, cancer, um, other issues that uh, health causes that were more dominant when when uh, on top of mind. What we did was to raise uh, awareness of this issue. We created a platform um, to talk more about the topic and educate the market through uh, medical professionals, uh, through working with rehabilitation centers, through working with uh, the children themselves, uh, with educators and so on, about uh, hearing loss, uh, the importance of early detection uh, for hearing loss in children. We created activations, um, uh, enlisted uh, celebrity support, uh, all for the cause, not for uh, uh, the brand, if that makes any sense. Um, and and with that, we were able to open up a position of attention for Zadel in that space. Um, and this was done, as I said, over a three-year period. Uh, it created awareness of the cause. It got people talking about it. It created an immense amount of conversations on social media and in uh, on broadcast uh, media as well. And that was how the, the brand was uh, strongly positioned. Yeah, so going the wrong way on tackling the problem and not uh, not jumping straight into the, into the solution and selling it. Exactly, it's, it's not a sales approach. It's Pause yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, I see no more questions are coming in, and it's been a great delight to listen to your presentation. And I want to thank you on behalf of all of the listeners and the Indian region of IABC for having the time for this webinar. And hopefully, we'll see you around in some other events of ours. Uh, thank you very much, Bia and uh, Alex, if he's here, thank you all for listening. Um, if there are any questions that come up later that get sent to the network, I'm happy to, uh, to respond. Absolutely. And we will put the recording um, with the permission, of course, uh, online. So if anybody wants to catch up, watch again, or miss them, want to re-watch again, you can find all our webinars on IPC Emina YouTube page and also check iabcemina.com for the upcoming webinars, as well as on our social media, we post everything there as well. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining, and uh, yeah, see you and talk to you later. Have a lovely Have a afternoon, thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.